Just Blaze. speaker on, our, on the lecture circuit today to talk about gender politics and so a more broader discussion outside of hip hop but you'll see how the dots connect. I'll leave it to you to tell the class more about you and don't worry they're nice. Okay <laughs> good good I like nice students. <laughs> and also body image for women. Now, these are three of the home study cor coaching courses that I've written. Um, and that's because I started to study the math and science of uh, healthy relationships and of happiness and how women thrive. Um, um, I graduated from University of Colorado Boulder and then I went to graduate school at Pepperdine University. Um, my background is in uh, mathematics education and also um, leadership and um, I am also a professional curriculum designer. I write math books and other things for school children. Um, I have experience as a professional plus-size mom. My book, In Body Terrorism, that will be coming out later this year, talks about that and our perception of pseudo-health and how um, body image is really used as a tool of control. And we'll talk about that a little bit uh, in this lecture when I talk about hypersexualization and how it kind of increased as women got more power and our own money and more independence. Uh, what does caveman have in common with modern man? So just kind of talk to your neighbor and tell me what you think. <laughs> okay, so how many of you, just by show of hands, you think that there's very little in common between caveman and modern man? Okay, how many of you think there are lots of things in common? And that's because you're really intelligent college students. That's a lot. Um, so what are some of the things you notice? Just I'll take a couple of responses. Yes, ma'am. Well, I mean, there's not much change in the privileged mindset, knocking a woman over the head, dragging her to the cave, that kind of thing. <laughs> and what her little raggedy place is. Okay. Yeah, okay. Anything else? Yes, sir. Um, the whole concept behind responsibility to get out and do more in a sense. Okay. Even if it's not, you know, having a good job, you're still providing for yourself, food, mm -hmm. shelter, et cetera. Okay. All right. Any, any more? Here's the thing that a lot of people in modern day don't like to accept about ourselves. We are the same exact species. This is a homo sapien. This is a homo sapien. This is a homo sapien. So inside of, at the core, at our core roots, we are caveman, cavewoman. And we've dressed it up with a lot of modern conveniences, but our survival instincts are the same. And so we'll look about different levels of survival. Survival has gotten easier for modern man, so you see some physical adaptations, but we're still the same species genetically. And so um, man's evolution, women too, uh, uh, is part animal, part spirit. And we don't, we sometimes don't like to see ourselves as animals or people maybe look down on animals for a reason I don't understand. Um, and then we say, oh, I'm not animal, but yes, you are. Yes, I am. Yes, we are, in part. And if people struggle to accept that, then you can't truly accept truths about yourself and you don't learn them. But advertisers in the media certainly have learn them and they use them to exploit our instincts and that creates a lot of the lack of civility in our culture because we don't see it coming. Okay, So I just want to talk about the goals of this particular talk and how it relates to your class in, in hip hop. I want to uh, at the end of the talk you should be able to link human mating instincts and gender politics. You should, you should be able to distinguish human animal needs from human spiritual needs. Um, you can explain the primary needs that motivate men and the primary needs that motivate women. They are different. The under, uh, to understand sexual identity through hypersexualization and emasculation and its impact on relationships and the family structure. And to see how um, these hypersexualization and emasculating images show up in hip hop and also in society. Any questions? I just want and then I want to check in um, with the professor here. Is there anything that 
you were hoping I would discuss is not covered by these outcomes. Okay, I tried, I tried to align as best I could. I just want to make sure it meets your needs as well. Okay, so at the core of, before we even get to politics, there's this question of what motivates humans to stay alive? If we are caveman and cavewoman, why do you even wake up for the next day when life is that harsh, okay? And so there are needs that we naturally biologically have with each other. And that's important to know because of every animal species, including humans, you have to procreate. The species has to survive. You have to make more people for the species to survive or it goes extinct. So male and females of every like species are born with a natural need for each other. Now it's important because as modern women we like to tell ourselves, oh we don't need men. It's not true. You will biologically always have that need and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, if and regardless of your sexual identity, which we'll talk about later, there is a natural need. We kind of have half of the equation that we're born with. And so um, the opposite gender is the helpmate for the gender. And, and we like to use helpmate in the possessive term of marriage, or, but it doesn't have to be. It's just we have a skill set as women and men have a skill set as men. And then politics get in and muddy the waters. Um, so at the lowest level of survival are just our biological and physiological needs, our basic life needs to breathe, uh, to eat, to get shelter, uh, warmth, sex, sleep. Now this type of sex is the lowest level of sex. It's just procreation. It's not love and connection. and It's just mating, breeding. Um, and then there's a higher level that we'll talk about later. And then safety needs, protection, security, order, law, limits, stability, <coughs> etc. These are deficit needs, and uh, Abraham Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs is what this is. And his theory is, um, it's used in education system, it's used to create the modern uh, motivations for businesses and uh, work promotions and different things in our society. So even if you've never heard of him, you've certainly lived his theory on some level. Now this was in the early 1900s, so other more modern um, behaviorists have adapted this theory and we'll look at some ad adaptations a little later, but this is the basic core of that theory. So uh, these deficit needs are kind of what we see going back and forth in the hip hop culture. So it looks like thriving, they dress it up with a lot of money, a lot of fame, showmanship, but it's the lowest level of survival that's being portrayed. And that's important because we make it look like thriving, but it isn't. It's um, animal mating instincts, and I'll show you how that looks. So you can be, get the best of what that world has to offer, and you're still down here in your animal um, instincts. Now, um, we've racialized that, but it's not race-based. It's hum every human has that. It's not about your color. It's about your opportunities, your methodologies to survive and what motivates you to stay alive. And so trading back and forth with these resources is where is the world of emasculation and hypersexualization in our country. So um, we're going to talk about gender politics and sexual identity. So I want to just work from the same definition. Um, there are different definitions. This is what I will be using for, for this particular talk. So politics, basically, politics about anything, is really about competition between competing interest groups or individuals for power and leadership. How do we trade those resources? Who gets them? Who gets more? Who gets less? Uh, et cetera. So that's all about politics. So gender politics, then specifically, is competition between men and women for power and leadership. Now, sexual identity is the way that we define ourselves sexually and who we look for to emotional and intimate love and support, who we identify with in terms of desire, lifestyle, politics, and more. Um, so we have to understand the basic animal mating instinct because that's what is triggering all this need for gender politics that humans have to mate to keep our species alive. So how do we do that? How are we motivated to do that? So at issue in gender politics is every male is born with an innate desire to pass on his DNA. Um, and females are naturally driven to mate with alpha males. Um, and so some of the common alpha male archetypes that women naturally will trade 
with, and we'll talk about trading agreements. Uh, we like to think marriage is all about love and romance. Uh, marriage was not created for that. It was a survival system, and it still is, but we like to think it's not, and that's one of the reasons why divorce is so high. Um, you can, of course, have the love that's important, um, but you can't ignore that there's sort of animal trading going on for survival, and how much of that do you need versus spiritual needs. Okay, so, um, so for common alpha male archetypes is the prince, the chief, who's like the leader, the, you know, in our country it's the president, but, you know, you don't have to be that <laughs> big of a leader, but, you know, leader of a group, leader of a society, some type of power of influence, um, because they tend to be both very good providers and protectors. Um, then um, some women uh, have lesser needs for provision and tend to go for more of a warrior, fighter, protector type because that's what they're missing. And then you have the scholar. And we like to think scholar, like, um, in earlier societies, knowledge was very limited. People didn't have books around. Um, so if you, if you had a lot of knowledge, you had a position of, of power, and you would be a better provider than someone who may not have that. Um, handsome, typically, um, every community and every society comes up with beauty standards. So they'll be radically different depending on where you live, but whoever has that has a status that gives them opportunities to be better providers. It's not automatic, but usually in societies, whatever their definition of handsome is, um, usually that provides a man with a higher status in uh, some cultures, and so then he becomes a better provider. Then also the strongest man is another alpha male archetype who tends to be a good protector, and then he will also have more opportunities to be a better provider because societies tend to offer um, very strong type of protectors opportunities to get resources, okay? So males compete with other males to gain this alpha male status because they're more likely to be selected for mating. That's the beginning of politics. Okay, so um, how do humans best survive? Now again, there's this core animal need to reproduce for the species to survive. So at the core, is, at the core survival, which is the lowest level of existence, um, is hunters and gatherers, okay? So what does that look like? Um, a female has a gatherer instinct. Um, she, this is natural to the feminine. It's just kind of born with an innate sort of uh, magnetism to certain things that you understand. You just, your, your DNA comes with a certain knowingness of how to do certain things. And so the belief system that go with f female survival is that females learn at a very early age that our bodies weren't designed to navigate such harsh terrain. You know, climb mountains, move rocks. We don't naturally have the strength that masculinity has, and we're aware of that, and it's a threat to our safety. So then we have this natural need to seek out safety just to navigate the environment. Um, lions, you know, uh, women learn early on that a man is better adept at fighting a lion than she is. Uh, so there's this need to seek out safety and security, and that will naturally lead her to seek out a, a male who can do that. But in her own uh, ability to survive on her own, women have a belief in abundance. Um, there's more than enough, because as a gatherer, you gather berries, uh, wood, you can take all that you can carry, and you can never carry it all. So as long as there's, the crops are good and it's not a time of famine, there you can just you know, pack the pantry. You can take all you can get. Um, they understand nature and how nature provides in cycles. So women have a very attuned uh, relationship with the earth and with seasons, and our body works like that uh, on cycles as well. Um, so you hoard while you can, okay? So even in modern society, when you see women over shopping, over spending, there's something in her gatherer instinct that doesn't feel safe doesn't feel provided for or protected enough. So if you have that need, you need to do things for your safety, usually um, what will make you feel safe, and that takes care of the spending oftentimes, or that hoarding effect. Um, safety in numbers, you'll notice even in our early 
primitive state, women collaborate, you make friends. Why? There's safety in numbers. If a lion does attack me and I have all my friends, I'm more likely to survive. So aloneness is unsafe. Um, and then there's a deep connection to make sure that I talked about. Okay. And so women have a brain, uh, brain wiring that makes us a nurturer. So we have a uh, more uh, neurons that connect both sides of our brains. And that allows us to see detail. So we can look in a meadow and say, you know, that's the poison leaf. That's the one that's not poison. And men see more visually large, you know, animals that can hunt and assess details in a, in a very sort of single focus way where we look at a whole meadow um, called diffuse awareness. Okay, so we have, now obviously men can create beauty too, but it, our brains are naturally designed to look at this and find the beauty in it. And so that is something that you'll see has trading value when you look to mate, okay? So the hunter instinct is natural to the masculine um, he provides, protects, and procreates. Um, he believes in scarcity. There's not enough. There's only so many animals that are going to come through, and the biggest, fastest, strongest one that gets there first is the one who eats. Um, and men can sometimes form a team and hunt together, but really they're trying to hunt and maybe trade that for opportunities to procreate. And so they may or may not want to share. So a lot of hunters are alone. There's a feeling of aloneness quite a bit for men in their warlike existence. Um, and they have to take a life to preserve a life. They take the animal's life to feed human life. So um, he has to decide what's worth fighting for, what's worth preserving. Why would he hunt the woolly mammoth for himself? He doesn't need to eat that much. So, if, so he's always wondering, am I the right kind of provider to trade my resources with the feminine? Um, so again, men, men uh, even prepare to die in the name of providing. Um, it's a very harsh existence, a very... Uh, survival driven. We like to think that it's way back in caveman, but it's still modern men do that. In some societies, they do live off of hunting, and including in, in the United States. Um, and men have a very deep connection to physicality. He, this man has to look with his eyes and say, could I successfully hunt that animal? And if he can't, then it's better to not hunt at all. Go find the animal that you'll be successful with hunting. So men have a very, or masculinity has a very, uh, exaggerated need to win, and sometimes we don't respect that as women, and we uh, belittle that, but it's it really, winning kind of has a life or death significance uh, with the masculine. Um, they understand landscape and boundaries, um, and we know that they're visual, but oftentimes that angers us as women. We experience their uh, visualness as, as violations to our body often, but that's not, Really, they're assessing, they assess information with their eyes and they make judgments and uh, conclusions with their eyes. When you uh -huh. say understand the landscape, mm -hmm. is that just space, not necessarily the woman's body? Interesting that we, if we understand the masculine, absolutely you can have boundaries with your body, and particularly if men have played sports. If you learn that sports, you can see, you know, how they. Like men are playing basketball and they step on the line and we don't like, we can see that, but they know that they're out. So absolutely, we can develop boundaries on our body, but they don't necessarily, they kind of look to you to get a clue where your boundaries are, but we as women don't necessarily learn how to use that space uh, effectively. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so any questions about the hunter-gatherer instinct? All right, so gender politics, of course, survival. Um, the feminine seeks safety, shelter, protection from predators, uh, rest while giving birth, animal protein. Um, the hunters can hunt animals and provide protein. Um, the, the women are gatherers gathering berries and nuts, and you could really die from protein deficiency in that environment. And so if a man shows up with the woolly mammoth, well, I mean, a lot of women would be willing to mate, trade sex for food. And that is how the species survive. Um, a masculine seeks procreation. He can't have a child. He has to convince a woman to have a child. So he comes to the table with trading resources. And so um, 
I call this caveman bling. You, you can tell this is the alpha male. Uh, you can see the animal skins he has. That's a signification. That, uh, that signifies, look how big of an animal I can hunt. You'll never go hungry if you procreate with me. Look at my big club, because that's how big of an animal I'd be down. And, you know, again, you know, I can build you safe shelter. Um, you know, the muscles, the strength. He, I can move the rocks. I could fight the lion. Um, so a lot of the, um, sometimes they wear animal teeth as necklaces, and the teeth come from animals that he's hunted to kind of show, you know, look how I can provide, procreate with me. So um, trading sex for food or sex for shelter, uh, safe shelter or, uh, is a common trait. Um, there are all kind of trading. You have women are willing to trade uh, procreation for a man with good DNA. Um, and it's not this exclusive, we're married, you're mine. It's if you have this physicality, it makes sense to procreate with you, then my children will be hunters like you. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not possessive. And he can mate with as many women willing to make this trait. Okay? Um, and again, you know, there are other trade agreements, and I just kind of made some arrows to show common trade agreements. You know, you'll ch sometimes men trade peace for building a safe shelter. He has this warlike existence. If he could just have a peaceful place to sleep, he'll trade that. Um, so uh, any questions about this? Okay, this is core survival. Okay, so, so then we move to efficient survival. That caveman, cavewoman lifestyle, the life expectancy is very, very low. And it's a very harsh existence, no quality of life, almost no joy. Um, in fact, the act of procreation is probably the most joyous thing that they experience, and that's also incentive. Um, hormones get released that potentially, if it occurs correctly, uh, that could give a, a, the best quality of life that's available to that type of existence. Okay. So, so men and women figure out how can we do this better. So efficient survival are hunters and gatherers coming together, living in communities. And in order for that to work out, what are the politics? What are the rules? Okay. So these communities or, and marriage systems go with communities. And we'll talk about why in just a second. But it's about procreation, lineage, passing on resources, and just better survival. It's not that whole romantic. You know, I love you, you know, you bring me roses. No, <laughs> we need to share better, live longer, and raise children more. A lot of times the procreation that happens with cavemen and cave women, neither person takes care of the child. The woman um, has incentive to breastfeed because it's good for her and the child, but after that, when the child walks, they don't necessarily get raised for a lifetime. They're on their own at a very young age, and so society doesn't increase. And, you keep relearning the same lesson, so there's a better way. So these are examples um, of a community that's woman honoring. How do we know that it's woman honoring? Okay, question. How do we know that this is woman honoring? You can see the homes look like a pregnant woman's womb, or it could look like a breast, and the entry doorway uh, looks like a birth canal. And so every day they understand we are here in this community to make better procreation, to make better choices about how life enters the world and how life uh, grows. Um, the women are naked, and no one's trying to rape them or subjugate them or hypersexualize them. That's also a sign, an indication of a woman honoring culture. When women are honored, men don't have to take their sexuality. It's offered. It's part of, of the agreement and trade. It's not this taking violating thing. Uh, you have a question, sir? I was just going to say, also, it looks, just from that picture, it looks like it's a closet style setup, the way they live, which typically means that it's a very difficult Okay. Okay. I was Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> oh, that, well, that's great. I wasn't um, aware of that. Um, this is a, a Native American community, and sometimes they're matriarchal, and sometimes they're sharing communities where the men are in charge, they're hunters and warriors, and there are threats to their survival ongoing, and the men go out and fight those battles, so they need to be in charge to make certain decisions, but there's no disrespect. There are also uh, some Native American communities have what's called a grandmother council, so the male leader is selected, but the women, usually the way you got to be in a grandmother uh, 
council is you had to reach menopause. And so they had to ratify the decisions that uh, men made. So there were different ways of sharing, even though the men still were in charge. So women honoring doesn't necessarily mean matriarchal that women are the boss. Um, matriarchy sometimes is as cruel to patriarchy, uh, as cruel to men as patriarchy can be as cruel to women. So, um, but uh, that's, that's an interesting insight I hadn't, I wasn't aware of. Um, this is just to show that there's still current day communities that have that same structure. Okay, so here enters patriarchal gender politics. We just looked at a woman honoring society. Now here's a patriarchal um, society and men are driven to control the resources to survive, including female reproduction. So women must partner with men who would not naturally be selected under alpha male standards. Okay, so and I'll breeze through this, but just visually look. You can see the buildings look like phallic symbols, more in fashion than a penis. Um, so men have all the power and they honor themselves in the architecture. And so where, what is the role of women? To be pretty and clean and beauty objects even when you're working out in the dirt all the time, okay? So that evolves. Now, you think women like this system? You think women like this system? You think women like this system? Okay, so this system was not and is not women honoring. Again, women make the trade for marriage because it makes better uh, survival, but it's not a good life and women want better. So that moves us to comfortable, highly efficient survival. That's what we're in right now. Um, so this is an example of a modern woman. Um, you'll recognize Gwen Stefani, and I, I like I like this picture because see, she still has the gatherer purse, right? All the money, fame, status, still a gatherer, They're just a classy, you know, more independent gatherer. Women still seek safety and security, but we don't always like to admit ourselves. We we don't always like to admit that to ourselves when we have comfortable survival. And so what happens is we get perpetually dissatisfied with men because they still have masculinity to offer and we tell ourselves, no, nope, we don't need that. We still need these alpha male archetypes. We still want to mate. Uh, naturally, whether you want to or not, your DNA calls you to desire to mate with an alpha male and um, we may or may not trade marriage for that, okay? So at every level, it's the same mating instinct, okay? so. What is the trading value this man has to convince her for marriage? Okay, so a woman that has her core survival, has efficient survival on her own, typically wants to trade her sexuality or trade procreation or trade marriage for love, for validation, romance, recreation. Now, think of caveman. Does he naturally do these things? So it's very emasculating, a lot of the things that women require from marriage. So what do men do to be selected? Okay, so here's where we get into gender politics to um, kind of push women to mate with men that would be non-select. A wonderful book that I love by uh, Master Yao Morris, uh, the Natural Blueprint for Relationships. He says, today we have a situation where 80% of eligible women are in competition for 35% of eligible men, or the alpha males. And so, patriarchal gender politics, we like to think that it's evil and that men are just out to oppress us, but it is a true issue that women don't deal with that is a reality that, um, when you choose men as non-select and the majority, about 65% of the men are in non-select categories, how is mating gonna take place? How is sex trading gonna take place? How, is, how will societies and communities work out? And we haven't thought through that a lot as women. And so the patriarchal gender politics, again, same as always, driven to control the resources to survive, including female reproduction, so that women must partner with men who would not naturally be selected. Okay, um, so emasculation then is to render um, a male less of a man by humiliation, 
uh, to separate a man from his power, to devalue masculinity. So basically this was all the things that were done to femininity and then women fought back and flipped the script and we're gonna do to you what was done to us throughout the whole efficient survival system under patriarchy. But the, the rub, the way that bites us as women, emasculated men pursue female sexuality more aggressively for fear that they will not be selected for mating. They need to devalue female sexuality to increase their own trading power. And that's how we get hypersexualization. Glut the market and you're more likely to trade. Okay, so here are some um, pressure strategies to get women to mate, to marry, and this relates to hip hop is, is what we'll see. So you have this religious obligation, you're supposed to breed, you know, that's, that's why you're here, you know. Uh, creating new alpha male imagery, pseudo alpha males. Um, and what that is, it looks like an alpha male, it acts like an alpha male, it hits all our triggers like an alpha male in terms of our DNA instinct to breed, but he actually isn't. He isn't going to provide or protect you. Um, create false male scarcity. Um, tell women, oh, there's not enough men, you better hurry up and go chase them and get one. It's not true, it's manufactured. If you look at birth statistics, male and females are born pretty equally. Now, because they create scarcity, the homicide rate's higher for men, the imprisonment rate's higher for men, remote jobs, so they're removed from society, that's higher. So there's this sort of manufactured scarcity to increase the training value that men have. If we follow that marriage system, you know, one on one, uh, there is no longer a one to one ratio as you increase in age, and that's by design. Uh, if you look at natural uh, life and death patterns that aren't interfered with, it is true that men have a lower life expectancy, but it's not as dramatic as what is manufactured in our culture. Um, some other ways that women are pushed to mate are anti-abortion laws, uh, devaluing women by stigmatizing singlehood. Who's heard the, how come you're not married? <laughs> you know, just what, grab someone off the street, like, let's head to the altar, yeah. That's gonna work out well. Um, again, hypersexualization, seduction. Um, there's this whole sort of uh, triggering the female mating instinct through science, through romance, through this Romeo type of guy that's not a provider or a protector, you know, but women respond to that because he knows how to trigger your mating instinct. Swag. Yeah, <laughs> the, the mag daddy, that's not a scientific term. But <laughs> um, moving women out of comfortable survival to efficient survival, because remember in efficient survival, women readily trade. Um, shame or embarrassment, you know, how come you don't have no man, you know, and you're supposed to come up with 10 reasons. <laughs> You know, and, and I love it, you know, men say that, it's like, how come you don't have a woman, you know? But um, anyway, that's, that's one of the strategies. And then this is a huge one in our culture, over-romanticizing wifedom and motherhood, that happily ever after, and what is that? Can you really define that? And women marry and don't get that, and the divorce rate is very high. Um, most, 70% uh, of divor divorces are initiated by women. But procreation typically has taken place. Mm -hmm. So you still have that trading of the um, procreative resource to continue the species. Um, basic male al uh, alpha male archetypes, we talked about that. But then we have pseudo alpha male ar archetypes. And you see this in rap quite a bit. Um, you have that bad boy, that danger, seduction, you know, mm -hmm risk taker and that's a protector of He's not gonna protect you, but he looks like he's tough and he could, but he won't. Um, that best friend, he's safe, there's no risk there. And that, that, that feels like self-protection, you know you can protect yourself. Um, and then he's there and you, uh, he doesn't need to, you think he doesn't need to protect you. And actually as a woman, there are things he does need to do for you to really have that gather instinct satisfied, but we think that we don't. The charmer, Romeo, the seduction guy, he provides you with the fantasy and you're like, oh, this is great. And uh, you know, that, that lost soul, that loner guy, but I'm gonna get him because I'm just, you know, that kind of woman that can snag him and I need to prove to myself I can get him. So that sort of challenge of getting an unavailable guy, um, the swashbuckler, that thrill seeker, you know, danger, again, that's a protector illusion. And again, the handsomest, but we've made handsome into something that may or may not have the status, but it has the status illusion. Um, and then the strongest, again, he may have big muscles, but 
is he going to protect you or do you need protection from him? <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> um, so again, uh, there, there are all these type of pseudo alpha males that trigger the uh, alpha male mating instinct that females have. I want to just point out, if you look at the pseudo alpha male archetype, it is profoundly compelling how that shows up with the uh, male and hip hop. Yep. And what's portrayed, and, and even yeah. the dialogue that took place earlier about, you know, what someone gay looks like, whatever the case may be, it all just falls into that kind of, just a, I call them delusional now. Yeah. I'm older and I meet men like that. I'm yep. like, you're delusional yep. about what you can actually do. Yeah. For me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that is true, but then again, there. We go back to that core question, we've got to make people some kind of way. So how do we get women to mate with non-select men? So this is an effective strategy. It's not a recipe for happiness, <laughs> you know, don't get confused, but it is a recipe to get more people on the earth, make more babies. So is it nowadays more than ever? No, it isn't. Um, this is a system of survival. Remember, it's just core survival, efficient survival, or comfortable survival. What we want is thriving, but we never even get there. So that's what I'm trying to show you. This is just the big dressed up caveman, cave woman show. And we think that we're above that. And we're living by caveman, cave woman instincts more often than we know. And we think we're not animals, and this is total animal behavior. Um, I mentioned that I look at the math and science of happiness. And so you know how if you apply for insurance, there are actuarials that predict you know, how much life expectancy you'll have? Well, you can do that for relationships. Now, you don't want to know <laughs> that your relationship is doomed for failure. Um, but many people, based on selecting by their mating instinct, that's where you get off the scale uh, divorce, and it's predictable. You know, oh, I'm going to spend the rest of my life based on, you know, how you look or based on your status that will probably be fleeting. It probably won't last a lifetime, so you can't choose by your mating instinct. But the good news, you will get strong children. You'll get children with good <laughs> DNA. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, Hypersexualization, to make extremely sexual, to accentuate the sexuality of women. Hypersexualized females view, view males as unsafe predators and are motivated to take the resources needed for survival from men instead of partnering with them. They need to weaken or emasculate men for their safety and security. Now we used to try to marry to get this. Now we have to emasculate to get this. So we don't have to. But in our cruel fighting society, that those are the rules. But again, remember that's the lowest level of existence. Remember Maslow hierarchy of needs. Okay, we don't have to live at that base level, but we're trained to, and our habits and our social uh, thing. Um, you know, I see you taking pictures, and that's fine. Um, if you would like for me to make this presentation available, um, that's fine. Yeah, um, it can't be used commercially. I, I am. This is part of how I earn my living. But you know, you, for your own study, I very much appreciate. Um, intellectual interest in these ideas, and I hope that people will expand them in different ways. It, it really, I think there's some information. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So I want yeah. to point out about that slide, and maybe you're going to bring it up. So when we do hear from female artists uh, mm -hmm. like Foxy Brown or Little Quint, Little Kim, perhaps in the Menage even, uh, Miss right. Elliott comes to mind, I don't want a five-minute brother. Right. Or I don't want this or that, that emasculation Absolutely. place. Um, and even as far as uh, there's this um, reality show, Real Housewives of Atlanta. Oh, yeah. And what I recently <laughs> caught on, one, apparently one of the characters is, is, has a big business related to one gratifying themselves sexually through toys. Okay. And this is becoming big business for her. <laughs> so to have this be on a popular cultural show, and she's telling women, if you don't need him, it's funny. It's funny you mention that um, because there was a recently in the media um, that Cordell Stewart divorced his wife. Right. He's on that show. I went to college to the same college with him. I don't know him well, but I've, I've met him, and it's just, it's just that that's what made me look at some clips from the show. But I, I don't really mm -hmm. watch it, so I'm not real familiar. And but supposedly part of that divorce is his his um, him like. 
Now maybe. Please, with her oh. idea of being a mother and having a career. I thought, yeah, he wanted a, he wanted a baby or something. Right. So, so see, there's that baby. trading, you know. Yes. Uh, and I mean, you. I know there were people very critical of that, but. Who's he supposed to have a child with if not his wife and he's married, you know? So, mm -hmm. so um, two sides to the gender politics that we don't always honor. Hypersexualization hyper and emasculation is this tug of war. The men pull to hypersexualize, the women pull to emasculate in this game of survival, but we don't have to live at that level. Fast forward, I want to show you all the triggers. This is the what I took from your presentation that mm -hmm. you did with your class. So this is the woman that was uh, in your earlier presentation. So here's how uh, hypersexualization imagery uses science to trigger mating instincts. Um, a woman's waist to hip ratio is a mating trigger for fertility. Um, so if you have about a 70% or 0.7 ratio of waist to hip, that kind of draws a man's eyes and says that you could carry a healthy baby. So it's a natural sexual attraction trigger, not I love you trigger, sex. Be, it's only sexual attraction. Now, look at this woman. I mean, look at her ratio. I mean, I don't know her measurements, but you can just see it's just totally mating. And then look at her, look at how her, her hips are a little elevated. Um, in the um, primate community, um, that is a mating call because rear entry is, is easier in that position. And so that's what some species do when they're ready to be pregnant. And it's an intentional that the woman knows that she's um, able to carry a child. She's um, in heat in some, not, not humans obviously, but like uh, other species that have estrus, there's a time when the female knows that it's time to mate. And so she will assume those types of positions and it is an invitation to mate. And so men have to look for that, or males of all species have to look for that mating call. I'm ready to mate. I'm ready to have a child. I select you because you meet my standards. I will produce your offspring. Um, and so they pick poses like that. If you don't have the ratio, you can do a hip shunt, and it makes a curve right here, and it, it creates the illusion. Okay, so this woman clearly has the ratio already. You can squat down and it spreads your hips so it looks more like that ratio. And she's doing a shunt. <laughs> Meet with me. <laughs> okay, now I'll analyze more. There's tons of attraction triggers. This is Nicki Minaj and she had implants to hypersexualize that uh, mating. She did? Yeah, those are implants. She admitted it Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Hypersexualized hair. Um, shiny hair is a sign of fertility. Yeah, the, hence the hairspray industry. Um, but in, uh, in videos, this is obviously not natural hair. Now, I'm not judging. I have my own set of unnatural hair. But you can see it's very in your face. They change the color. They make it very long so you can't miss it. Uh, all kinds of colors. Look at my sexual hair. Look at my fertility. Mate with me. That's the subliminal message. Also, in this picture, um, even this type of cleavage, you don't need large breasts. It's the cleavage that is a mating instinct because girls uh, prepubescent don't have cleavage normally. Um, that's changing a little bit due to food additives. But um, typically, a, a woman, once she reaches her fertility, then she, her breasts change and she can have cleavage. I'm working it out. Um, hypersexual lips, eyes, cleavage. Um, red lips, when a woman is naturally aroused, uh, color rushes to her lips. So red lipstick or pink lipstick is a mating signal. Very full lips that get more engorged are mating signals. I already talked about cleavage. You can just see she's just, uh, the eyes. Can you see just the hypersexualization done by surgery? And she was pretty to start with. So I'll fast forward. Um, I'll just do a couple quotes. There was a book called The Beauty Myth, and it talks about how images or beauty are used against women. And so here's a quote by Naomi Wolf. The stronger women were becoming politically, the heavier the ideals of beauty would bear down upon them, mostly in order to distract their energy and undermine their progress. And so my book, In Body Terrorism, One Size Never Fit All, uh, kind of focuses on that. And we look at 
beauty standards all across the world throughout time, and they're all about control, like Chinese um, foot binding, um, head binding, all kinds of things that where you handicap yourself so you prove that you're controllable and then you can get the highest status, which is really not high status. Real quick, I won't go into all the details, but if you could just take a second and look at all these mating sex triggers that surgically, makeup-wise, clothes-wise have been uh, done to her, there are zero provider protector instinct triggers. That is hypersexualization. Is that yeah, it, a man looks at that and says, Breeding, stop. I can Holy. have a baby. Uh, I can carry healthy children. I've got DNA, breed with me. Nothing that says take care of me. None of the triggers that say provide for me, protect me. And subsequently, that's why it would be so, I guess, easily for the narrative of hip hop, particularly from men performing heteronormative behavior is, I just want to hit that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now I want to yep. be your husband, provide for you. And then they, they write songs for women who hypersexualize themselves that say, I, that's what I want. Yes, sir. And so you're saying we, so for men who are not alpha males, the 65%, they'll move to hyper, hyper so that they can make even though naturally. Right, to reduce the trading value of female sexuality and increase their trading value. But again, you don't have to be in that survival system. I mean, and we're not breeding cavemen to hunt woolly mammoths. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the system that we're following. <laughs> but uh, if you follow that system, gotcha. yes. Uh, this is the other woman, and, and you can see here's the trickery that really um, frustrates both men and women and sends such a bad message. The, she has take care of me triggers, only a few, but, uh, and I changed the color. Uh, the light, delicate feet are take care of me triggers at me. I, because if you, she worked the fields or if she had the harsh life, then her feet would reflect that. Same thing with uh, hands and fingernails. I didn't put that. Um, and... Uh, the light colors that that is clean that's a take care of me trigger um her eyes could be except she has a sexual look in her eyes but the sparkling eyes show receptivity that which could be receptivity to love or receptivity to sex and so she had cut the eyes that say uh, sex the red lollipop remember i talked about the red lips okay so they have the red lollipop so then the use of the tongue uh, is also a mating trigger so all that's going on. So this woman, men might think, oh, okay, well, you know, that's the type of woman I could take care of. But then there's all this hypersexualized stuff that kind of goes below radar. They don't necessarily know that they're being triggered in that way. They just like her and hope to find love there. But that's usually not what she's trading. <laughs> um, so again, alternative trading, and this relates to your earlier talk about um, uh, homosexuals, and then there's this whole idea of non-gay homosexuals or people who have uh, a split between their value system and sexual orientation, or some people who really are not homosexual, but it's too hard to get along with the opposite sex, so they'll trade with the same sex. And so that's one of the debates in uh, marriage right now, gay marriage, that there are abnormally high levels of homosexuality now. I personally believe it's natural for some people, but what is unnatural, the numbers are too high right now, and so I suspect there's a lot of this going on that people just don't want to trade with the opposite sex, so they make a trading agreement with same sex. Um, and then the vicious fighting, you know, also really leads to pathologies like pedophilia, prostitution, um, excessive masturbation that, that you mentioned on that shell hole industry of that, um, pornography off the scale. So um, how could we do this in a more healthy way? Um, so the human animal needs is everything we just talked about that we see um, mating triggers and all that. But human spirit needs different rules. 
you make a spiritual agreement, you make an honoring partnership, just like the efficient survival communities that honor women. So we have models for that, we know how to do it. The sex for survival was what that whole hip hop game is doing, but it's sexual intimacy that is the beginning of thriving. That's what people really need, but you cannot get that from a hypersexualized woman, and here's why. I'm gonna just move forward, okay? Patriarchy set up a model that created a heart yoni split. Uh, yoni is like an honoring, a Sanskrit word to honor female uh, reproductive organs and your vagina, your uterus, your whole uh, reproductive area, okay? So men go for sex or love. So they created, uh, you see a lot of literature that calls it the Madonna whore complex. Um, and there's this belief, you know, we can sow our oats and then find this great loving woman. Well, if every man's out sowing his oats, where are these loving women going to come from? And can you really depend on that? Can you raise your daughters? and really depend on empowering a husband, uh, is that the best choice, is that the best route for survival when this is the philosophy of how you should be treated as a woman. Now we fought that, we got our own system, but we didn't do better, we just parted ourselves out more. I'll just cut off my heart and my sexuality and just be all brains, or I'll just have babies on my own and with no other parts of me, uh, or trading, um, or I'll be all heart, or the illusion of nurturing. See how uh, her breasts, they have the cleavage, we can get that surgically now. Um, so is it really nurturing? It looks like it, but is it? Um, or I'll have sex like a man, you know, I'll take the power and, and it's not powerful. Our, our bodies are designed different as a woman. If you're copying what men do, you're not um, an empowered woman. You're treating your sexuality as sacrificial and not trading for anything. Right. Truly empowered woman would be put back together with scars, which may not go <laughs> together um, perfectly, but queens are flawed and fabulous. Mm -hmm. And so when you use your queen feminine energy, which we don't necessarily know how to do well in our society, but part of my work is to, do the, to teach women to do that. Um, as a feminine woman, you don't do all those trading games. Um, this is J.D. Salinger, um, a, a famous writer, and here's how he uh, writes about a feminine woman. She wasn't doing a thing that I could see except standing there, leaning on the balcony railing, holding the universe together. Yeah, catching her eye. Okay, so, um, so that's it. I think I went over time. Uh, if you have questions, please ask me. So we do have like six minutes for that. Okay. Yes, sir. So you just kind of started touching on the whole thing of like pedophilia and chronic mm -hmm. masturbation yeah. and just women training sex without doing anything. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, is that the result of trauma? And how does, or what are, I, I'm just kind of wondering like where, where the trauma of failed relationships and stuff like that, the trauma of not being comfortable in your own sexual identity, how does that affect like this mass love hierarchy? Or, um, uh, thank you for asking that. Um, but remember the slide that says the higher levels, when you begin to thrive, there's sexual intimacy? A lot of women haven't experienced that. They've experienced sexual violence because of all the hypersexualization. Um, or they experience men as unsafe, and then they have that heart yoni split, so they're kind of shut down, waist below. They know that they have to offer up their sexuality as a trade or as a bargaining tool to have a relationship, but they're not feeling unification of the heart and body. That's why it's very important I tell women, I'm, it's not that I'm old fashioned, I'm actually not as conservative as people think, but you really have to wait to have sex with a man when you can offer your heart and body together without other expectations. But you have to have standards so that your standards has pre-screened that he is the right provider and protector for you. It works. Mm -hmm. uh, this may not be Right class asked this question. I'm asking, like, do you think uh, monogamy is patriarchal or matriarchal? Very good question. Um, I have a slide that I had to fast forward through. Remember, we talked about trading agreements, sex for food? So the men were trading food to control the sexual and reproductive resources of the woman. They weren't offering up their sexuality as part of that trade. So men weren't ever trading for monogamy. That came in with 
that sort of religious obligation to procreate. Yeah. So men just up the offer, I'll give you control of my sexuality and you give me yours. Um, I know there's a lot of feelings about that, but I go back to science. Look at animal behavior. Um, there are certain species, like uh, there's a mole, uh, kind of like a prairie dog a type of mole that lives, uh, I, I didn't brush up on that, it's not local to the United States, but um, they were thought to be monogamous, right? Because there aren't many species in society that are monogamous. Um, and because think the species have to survive, you breed for good DNA. Um, you may and have that love and belongingness for love and for good feelings, not for reproduction necessarily. Um, but this mole, they now that we have DNA testing, they tested the mole and they tested the children. Um, the, the, the coupling lasts for a lifetime and they raise the children, both the female and male. Um, but when they tested the DNA of the children, they showed that the female woman, did, uh, the female of that mole species did go mate with the best DNA. But again, they have... But it's, it's not necessarily a betrayal. Their, their survival right. is better. Their children contribute to their survival because they have that good DNA. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to add that to, like, again, like, setting back to my anthropological pseudo-expertise. Um, <laughs> yeah, if you look at, like, evolutionary human logic, mm -hmm. polyamory suits the women far more than monogamy does. Say that again. Polyamorous, so having oh. multiple loves or multiple... Um, so it's not that type of monogamy, you know, we're in the streets and get all you can, but it's just not mating for life. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. And, and you brought up the issue of trauma before. Sometimes women who have been sexually violated, and one in three women in this country have, um, they feel that it's empowering to choose their own lovers. So sometimes it is a reaction to their pain. Um, the true litmus test is, are you doing anything sacrificial? As a woman, you have thousands of pleasure centers. You're capable of multiple orgasms. You can breathe yourself into an orgasm. Can you do that? Is that what hap is happening with the guy? And if it's not, there's something sacrificial going on. You know, we like to think that everyone's just having these great sex lives. The reality is 60% of women are non-orgasmic. Oh, man, I'm, in the <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not asking anybody's right, business. Right. <laughs> uh, maybe I don't know if that is too much of a thing to get by. But um, well, that concludes my talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, my, my website is ebooklifecoach. If you want to sign, e ebooklifecoach.com. If you want to sign up my, for my mailing list, I, I write articles. I write columns and blogs, and I'll have a book that's coming out, so, uh, at the very beginning, yeah, oh, it's covered up by this uh, little banner here, but, um, yeah, ebooklifecoach.com, thank you so much for your time and attention. And all three of these books are out already.